hello everyone uh, welcome to this uh, interview series where we have a alumnus uh, who graduated uh, from his uh, phd in 2012 right uh, it's uh, 2014 actually 2014 so he has been already living in netherlands for more than a decade and he is dipen sa from india so it was very nice that he agreed to share some of his experiences of studying and living in netherlands so uh, he is currently a head of protein engineering and production at ju bio bv so we'll start with the first question with dipen like maybe give a brief background of your education in uh, india and when did you leave india and why right so uh, hello everyone uh, i'm i'm pleased that sambit is giving uh, opportunity to give um uh, what my interview to to you guys um it's it's useful and i appreciate what he's doing for for everyone that's willing to come here to holland uh, in netherlands uh, so um to give you my background um I grew up uh, three hours away from Mumbai uh, in a small town. Um, where I did all my schooling and up to 12th standard, the education system that we have in India. Then uh, I moved to Mumbai, where I did my bachelor's of pharmaceutical sciences degree, um, and that was at Institute of Chemical Technology. Um, then I moved to the UK. Uh, and I can explain you later the link between why it chose UK versus US because most of the people have that questions. Um, so I went to the UK. Uh, I was looking for something to switch my education towards more research oriented. So I was looking specifically for a program that would be oriented towards research. Um, and there was a program called MRES. I don't know if it still exists, but this is, was a sort of not an MSc but an MRS degree, which is Masters of Research, uh, and I followed that in the UK uh, for about a year, and then um, I was into research. I wanted to see, okay, what's the next possible step? Whether you want to go to industry or continue academic research uh, further. And at that moment in time, I thought maybe it's good to just do a PhD just to get a bit more deeper understanding. So I did my PhD then in Leiden University. So there was a move from um, UK to Netherlands. Uh, the time period was 2007. I left India in 2006 to do my masters, and I continued my PhD till 2012. was the uh, the time that was allocated for phd then i was working in the company where i'm still working at zobio uh, and i was writing the thesis simultaneously at the same time so i graduated officially in 2014 uh, from my phd and then uh, for a couple of years i continued my work at zobio uh, we were a startup initially so company was small uh, and it was also growing at the time Uh, and i felt the need um to 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 do some management courses and that was later i think in 2016 together with my um bosses at the company uh, we decided okay maybe it's something beneficial for the company uh, but also for my own, my own career development to get some management courses done so that's why i pursued project management and diploma in business administration uh, degree at 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 rotterdam school of uh, uh, business uh, that's close by in rotterdam from here so that's in nutshell uh, background oh, okay okay uh, so if i quickly browse through your linkedin profile then i see that from the beginning of 2013 you are associated with the company that you mentioned zoo bio bb yeah. so can you please be give a brief background of what you do there and what's your research or work about and how did you become associated with it right um so i have to go back in time a little bit uh, when i had applied for the phd position uh from my masters when i graduated from my masters um my research supervisor in masters recommended uh to go to leiden i showed him that, that there is a position in leiden 
Uh, and he said, yeah, he had worked or he knew some colleagues at Le in Leiden at the time. So he thought, oh, that's a nice place to go. So I looked uh, at the position. And at the time, the academic or the group leader who was giving me this or the published this position also had a company then. So my first thinking process there was, okay, if I do get a PhD position there, I will naturally have some exposure to the company as well because it was going from the same academic group. Um, so yes, um, that's where I first came in contact with Zobaya already when I was starting my PhD. And during my PhD, I was in contact all my research that was done in the academic group of my supervisor because he was having this company on the side. It was quite interlinked. Uh, so at the same time, I got to know the company. Um, later in 2013, when I joined the company, I joined as a postdoc. Uh, and there my interest was to apply what I did in my PhD in the company. At the time, we were trying to um, come out with a scientific method how to quickly get uh, information about small components of drugs binding to proteins. Uh, so what a company does at the moment is uh, identify, or in some cases we have big clients uh, from pharmaceutical companies. They come to us with a protein that is either associated with a disease or an illness, uh, and what we try to do is um, make that protein in bacteria. It's a human protein. We make it in bacteria or human cells. Um, and once we get access to that protein, uh, we would use small components of medicine. You know, the medicine that you get in the pharmacy is not exactly what we start off with. We start off with very small components of those, and over a period of five to ten years, you almost come up with a molecule that might be suitable for uh, for treating that disease, uh, for example, by uh, via this protein. So um, that's how I started in 2012. My core interest was to make sure that what I've learned in my PhD apply in the, apply in the company. And as company grew, uh, there's a lot of organizational changes that happened with the company. And one of my interests then also coming back to this management degree was then to lead a team of scientists within the company in a one particular area. And at the moment, we call it protein engineering and production, where my role fits in. Uh, this is where we make proteins uh, in, the, in the quality that is needed. And we use that to, uh, to, to then screen thousands of molecules, which may one, one day will develop into, into drugs against those proteins. So at the moment, Company split up into four different groups, and I'm uh, one of the groups that I'm leading uh, with, with ten scientists at the moment. So that's a nutshell a bit of what company does and what how I fit in. Okay, okay, that's very nice to hear. Uh, so if uh, I, I saw that uh, you had an interview with the Holland Alumni uh, Network, so from there only I found you like the the short blog that someone wrote it was very interesting like what you are doing and when did you come from india and what's your interest and you have already lived here for a decade yes. so i also saw a small text there that you said like uh, you are already i mean you are maybe going to be associated with it or your research might lead to it so what are your thoughts like whether uh, the work that you are doing currently, is it going to somehow be associated with the COVID-19 vaccine research or what's your like take on it? So, uh, yeah, I, th I think I should give a bit of background here. So, so of course, it's a very special situation that we are in uh, with COVID-19. Um, of course, it changes everything, <laughs> what we are doing at the moment. Um, there's two types of research I think you need to hear about in the news. One is the vaccine research, um, and the other one is uh, having a cure with a medicine, right? Uh, vaccine is something that you take a sort of microorganism, you sort of detoxify it to the level that it doesn't, is not strong enough to, to cause a disease, but it still enables the body to... Uh, make a, or give an immune response that is capable of fighting that virus. 
what we do is we don't we are not involved in the vaccine research what we do is the second part which is once somebody has a infection or coronavirus or any other illness there is a medicine that you can just take orally or by injection uh, that would interrogate with that protein involved in the microorganism um, we are at the moment currently not associated with the covid 19 research uh, or at least uh, helping uh, with the COVID-19. But certainly we are progressing that, for example, if we have a client who is interested in doing that uh, with us, uh, we are open to do that. And what our company does, it doesn't matter which disease it is for, uh, as long as we can identify the protein that is involved uh, in, in the research or in the disease. We can identify that protein, for example, in a coronavirus situation, if there is a protein uh, involved, we'll take that protein, we'll make that protein, and then we'll use our expertise to come out with molecules uh, that would uh, nullify its effect. Uh, if you look into media or some of the scientific research uh, articles, people have already taken steps to make the protein or isolate the protein that is critical for coronavirus to affect uh, human cells. So at least we know which protein it is. So it's a matter of now taking that protein, making it, and then trying to screen a lot of molecules against it. That's that's what we can do. So we can enable that research, but we're waiting for the right partner to do that. Okay. Okay, that's very interesting to know. So but it takes a lot of time because even if you have a vaccine, it, the downstream steps, which is testing in animals, testing in subset of humans in quite small steps so phase one to phase three clinical trials you commonly hear about it's a period that takes five years at least and what we're trying to do now is to sort of compress it in about a year because there is such a high necessity to have this uh, vaccine so of course uh, you have to carefully think about the whole process and see how efficiently we can come up with with both my Personal opinion, we should start with both. So vaccine at the same time, but also trying to find out with the medicine. Because if one or the other fails, at some point you have a backup. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So do you also offer internships or thesis in the company that you are currently leading, uh, ZooBio and... Uh, are these intensives or thesis offered to only students who are studying in Netherlands or you also accept students from other European countries or from abroad? Right, no, that's a good question. Um, I think our company believes very well that students who are actively involved in bachelor's or master's level study should get exposure to research. Um, so they get, they get exposure. So we do have routinely, I think we have in, in our past existence, had many bachelor's and master's students coming for an internship, coming from three months to about a year. So we do take internships. Whether we are open to people outside Netherlands, yeah, it depends on case by case basis, practicalities of how their research is applicable to ours and how we can help them out and also other way around. Okay, and I think if you are also accepting someone from outside of Netherlands, then the visa and other things also yeah. is might be like because if it is for a short duration, like two three months, then I don't know, like maybe it might be complicated. Like yeah, it, it does. It, it is a complicating factor, especially visas. But if you uh, in our company, we are twenty six uh, in in number of employees, but we have about twelve different nationalities. So. Um, it's a very international research environment and we are used to these kind of visa related issues. Uh, but of course, in, when you talk in context of internships, you have to weigh options in, okay, how is it going to benefit both parties, in this case, student as well as the company. Um, but visa may become a problem, especially in the current situation. Okay. Yeah. And what field of work or study like students can apply like for example is it like who are studying medicine or chemical engineering uh, yeah. so i mean what are the disciplines that you touch upon in your company like right right no that's a good question so uh, we have uh, 
broad area of applications, uh, but I think mostly we look for people who have either done biotechnology uh, as a course or life science technology, it's called in Holland, uh, the course, or pharmaceutical sciences. Um, basically, we are interested in somebody who is in along with some protein research, so protein-related uh, research or recombinant protein research, we call it. So those are the areas where uh, we look at, we also look for chemists, chemistry, organic chemists, uh, or medicinal chemists sometimes uh, also. Um, and sometimes we also look for computational people to have to be able to analyze all of the information. So bioinformatics, uh, algorithms, people who are mathematicians. Uh, so it's kind of very broad, depends on how the project fits, fits and what we need. But I would just encourage if somebody's interested, just send an open CV with your interest. Look at our website. Uh, it's www.zubayo.com. So uh, yeah, I'll leave it in the description below so that they can click on it. Yeah, and there's all of the information about what we do. And if there's any questions, they can always ask me, uh, send an email. I can, I can give you my email as well. OK, that I'll also leave in the description below. So yeah, so this is what i ask everyone this question whenever i do a interview like what is one thing that you like the most about your current research or work and one thing that you dislike the most about your current work yeah right uh, that's a kind of tricky question <laughs> uh, well first one what do you like the most um it's still difficult for me to decide what you like the most but i think the most stunning thing that uh, for me um, resonates the most is uh, we have a very international environment in the company. Um, so, for example, we have 11 different nationalities. So if you have a problem, we are sort of looking at from 11 different angles uh, at the same thing. And it just makes an environment a bit more vibrant. So when you have different nationalities, you have different thinking, you have different cultural patterns. And to apply that to a research environment, uh, I think it's, it's something that I feel is necessary for creative thinking. Uh, what I dislike, um, I don't know whether I dislike it, but it's of certainly a challenge um, would be uh, because we're always working in a research environment. You don't have a guarantee that it will be your project will be successful. Uh, there's always a high chance that a project will be successful. There's no, no never a guarantee. And when a client comes to us, mostly they come with a problem that they have not been able to address or solve. And we have to take it from there. So you're always starting with a difficult problem. And sometimes you may end up uh, banging your head against the wall that, uh, yeah, this problem is indeed not solvable. And that's something very hard to accept because at the end, you want to find solutions, right? You want to help people. You want to help clients and ultimately patients in the end. But sometimes your progress is limited uh, because you truly research. You cannot really control mother nature. Well, sometimes uh, that's that's something I find it difficult. Okay, uh, so if I may ask, like, uh, when when whenever you work on certain projects, uh, is it like always from driven by the clients? Like, okay, the clients have a certain uh, problem, and you need to address that. So you like have a certain time period, budget, and everything, or you also apply like for example in our case like when uh, i mean you might have also seen that like when you uh, sometimes people in their third year or final year of the phds also write grant proposals with their professors and that helps them to fund their postdoc or yeah. uh, maybe remain in the academics or do something with the industry so is it like in your case like it goes both ways like you also apply for these kind of european proposals or something and you also work with the clients or it's only right. like from the client side like no it's a great question um so we 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 started off from leiden university it was a startup from leiden university our company uh, so we do have our academic beginning so to speak with uh, where the company started originally from um so at the company at the moment, we, we do indeed apply for European grants uh, that help us for projects that are a bit long-term vision. So for example, that continue over a couple of years. And there we would 
Of course, there's a distinction between client projects and grant projects. Grant in terms of the demand. So client projects are much more driven to solving a problem or giving client what they need uh, in the end. And that is always comes with a budgetary constraint, uh, quality constraint, and the time constraint. And as a company, you have to make sure that you have done enough of client projects so that you as a company survive. But at the same time, you come across new problems uh, or because you're working on a client uh, projects, you do come up with, okay, now this is something that we miss in this uh, pipeline of technologies. Maybe we should investigate more so that in the end, uh, when we take new projects, we may be able to do them quickly or at least efficiently. Um, so those are the sort of technology oriented projects which take a longer term and thinking. Uh, we typically tend to either fund in internally or via European grants. There is some budgetary concepts, constraints there too, but it is not as strong or as uh, as high as client projects because there you have your own, you have much control over all of the project or client has complete control over their projects. So it's a bit of a different um, ball game, to, so to speak. Uh, client projects typically have a shorter timeline compared to the long-term uh, grant projects. Yeah, we do. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, so what are the, um, as I like going back to your uh, stay in Netherlands, mm -hmm. so you have already lived here for more than a decade, so right. what are the biggest challenges or benefits that you saw like uh, in your decade long stay, more than a decade long stay in Netherlands? So did you have any kind of major failure or rejection? Because uh, normally, I mean, people always talk about the benefits. So just to give that other side to everyone, like, OK, uh, I mean, I also made a video on that. Like, uh, for example, we submit this conference or mm -hmm. to the journals during our PhD. And sometimes one literature review takes along like maybe five or six rejection and then you have a acceptance in a very high impact factor journal. So something like that because you are also a researcher. So did you face any kind of major failure or rejection during this period? And uh, maybe you can share what are the life lessons that you learned during these experiences in brief? Like Right, right, right. Yeah. So I can take that question in two parts. First part is um, major challenges that I felt or I came across during my PhD research, for example. So I think this is true across 90% for PhD students. The project you start with is not the project you end with. At least in my case, it was definitely true. Uh, and at least for my colleagues who were working with me at the time. In the end, uh, I started on one project and I ended up doing six different projects. So if I look at my thesis sometimes, I just cannot figure out how did I manage to finish all the six different projects, right? Um, so there, I think it's just accepting that that's the part of the process. Uh, you have to have, you have to be prepared for what you will take on as a research project may not be the one that you will be end up publishing about. It very well could be if it's all very well planned out and your research favors your uh, hypothesis, then it's pretty much easy. Um, but if you look at the real world situation, it's always some, what you expect is not actually what you see in the end. So um, I think that's one of the challenges that I face in my PhD. Also, there were time periods in my PhD then you start to question, right? You're not so exposed. It's always easy to look back 10 years and say, okay, this is what I should have done. But when you're in that phase, it's very difficult to to keep your head straight, so to speak, because one thing fails, the second thing fails, you still have hope. No, I can maybe still make it. You know, your parents are still supporting you, your family supporting you. But when the moment five projects fails, then you either start to question the research or yourself. That are you doing things right or is it just a research? So it's just making sure that in my case, I was trying to always discuss problems with not only my supervisor, but also people around me. And that's why 
this integration of a company atmosphere when I was doing my PhD and academic atmosphere was truly helpful because uh, the interaction that I had with colleagues usually supports you a lot. And, and what it turns out now uh, is that things that did not work during my PhD are actually the things that are useful in industrial research. Because if they would have worked, I would have not been so careful as I'm now, because I just know if things go wrong, you exactly know what not to do in a project. So I think my piece of advice, if I can give for people, would be that uh, don't uh, get disappointed if things don't work out. It's always later, maybe five years, maybe next tomorrow, or maybe 10 years down the line, you'll always find a way that, okay, that thing didn't work out, but that I learned from it uh, this uh, this much, and then you can always apply it back. Okay, this is not, I'm not going to do this in my research because you just have that big, bit broader your horizon a little bit because of things that do not work. When things work, it's pretty much straightforward for everyone. So uh, that was one of the language uh, or one of the challenges that I faced. The second um, challenge, I think, coming to a foreign country um, is the language. Now, Netherlands is sort of an exception compared to other European countries. Um, most people will speak English to you. If you make an effort to speak Dutch, they will reply to you in English because they know. Um, but at the same time, if you spend enough time to at least know basic proficiency in Dutch language, that will help you a lot. Uh, I think I did, uh, as a part of university PhD program, we were asked to take uh, a basic Dutch course, uh, because we in the end also had to teach students uh, during our PhD program. That was pretty useful. Uh, also looking back now, I think if you have a better control on Dutch language, it helps you just integrate with people more easily, uh, especially in a social, uh, social life. If you do sports, for example, it just becomes that easier to, to get together. So I think it was a challenge initially, Dutch is not a simple language, at least for me to learn, uh, and it still remains difficult. Um, but as long as you can read and understand people and speak a little bit broken Dutch, that's still enough to get through. Uh, I think that was my second challenge, but still I think it's, it's good to put an effort into it. Okay. Uh, that, that's, so that's two things that, uh, that uh, comes to my mind. Okay. Yeah, so... I mean, I can also totally relate to that, uh, like the Dutch speaking Dutch part, because uh, I mean, till now I have not made that effort. So that's why, uh, although I can, I mean, I feel now that I can understand like maybe like 60 or 70 percent. My understanding is much, much better uh, in terms of hearing and making out the context what people are speaking, uh, because I have already lived like, I think, five years. And, uh, but my speaking is like, it's because I have never given the effort. So it's not like it is very difficult, but if I really give the effort, then I think it's not that difficult when you are uh, always hearing those same words, uh, maybe yeah. in your office or in the train station or like different places like. Yeah, yeah, right, right. I, I think uh, your language is something that is fabric of a society. So. Uh, people always tell you, okay, learn the language, learn the language. Uh, especially European language for me is a bit difficult to learn. I mean, we bring, we, when we grow up, we in India, where we are exposed to multiple languages. Uh, in one time, at least in my family, it was the case. Um, but learning a new language now, uh, and that's to an European language, was really a challenge at the beginning. But that should not stop you. The benefits when you have learned a little bit more, far more outweigh the challenges that you face at the beginning. So. Don't give up <laughs> and just keep it, keep it, uh, keep, keep, keep giving your effort in. Okay, uh, good advice. Yeah, so going to the final question, uh, any final advice or tips you want to give to anyone who wants to research or work uh, in the similar field as yours, like right. whatever uh, you're working on now? Uh, yeah. Any, yeah. That's a good question. Um, if I were to give advice to myself 10 years ago um, would be first you have to identify whether you really want to be in research you know it's it, it's 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 not that you and start doing research 
and you start to feel, oh, I'm doing really great stuff here. I'm going to change the world. I know that's the feeling that we have when we're growing up, that I'm going to change the world by research. Yes, that is the end goal uh, of everybody who does the research, but that is not what you start with. You start with very simple steps in order to achieve that goal. Um, so first is to identify whether you're really committed to research as a long-term investment uh, you would do for yourself. I think you will start to see fruits of research maybe 10 years after you've done something. So you need to have that long-term view in your mind. Especially somebody who's interested in a protein research or research, research that we are doing for medicinal chemistry or drug discovery process. I think it's, 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 it's more about um, trying to follow the right courses at the university and then trying to choose the right uh, company or academic group that will help you uh, further your research. Now, choosing the courses, you always start with a bit broad. In my case, I started with pharmaceutical sciences, which is still a drug discovery related course. But what I actually studied was how drugs are made. So how do you make those in the company? Uh, how do you package it in a pill? And how do you give it to patients or to the pharmacy? That's what I learned. But I realized that that's something that comes at the very end of what I do at the moment. What we do at the moment is really start of the medicine making process, really, really basic, but really fundamental part. So first is to identify which course would relatedly associate with your research interests and then take it from there and make a judgment. OK, really, I want to pursue my research and do a PhD uh, or move to management if you want to sort of only apply the research, but more make sure that the research gets a proper um, uh, proper channel in an industry environment, because it's sort of a balance of two, uh, two things. So there's no real advice I can give to people, but it's more like identify a research interest and be sure that you want to do it and commit yourself for long term. There will be always up, ups and downs in the process, but as long as it's long term. Don't exit as an investment. Uh, uh, I'm Gujarati, so I knew my my daddy, my my dad was brought up in a stock market situation. So it's always about long term. Don't exit in between. So it's so it's the same advice I would get. Okay, I I recently started investing in stocks, so I can relate to that. Yeah, indeed, indeed. It's always about long term, people say, and that is indeed true. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Dipen, for giving your time on a Sunday for uh, enlightening the people and uh, like sharing some of your experiences with the people out there. And I hope that uh, people who are interested in similar fields or maybe interested in research might get some useful advice or useful information from this video. So if you like this video, then don't forget to smash the like button and share this video among all your friends or people who want to come to Netherlands or study abroad. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you have not subscribed yet. So I will see you in upcoming interview vlogs. Till then, bye from Valkenburg, Netherlands. Bye. Peace out.